Hello, everybody. We are in a series called Courageous Faith. And if you've been tracking with us for a while, you know we're going through the, the 11th chapter of Hebrews. So if you have a Bible, I invite you to, to get out Hebrews 11. And it's, it's sort of a, a listing of several uh, heroes or groups of heroes. Uh, and we've just been pretty much taking them in order, you know. And so uh, several weeks ago, I just planned out which which person, you know, we, we would uh, talk about, preach about on which Sunday. Uh, and this was, like I say, it was, I, I would say, uh, a month or two ago. And I could never have seen or foreseen that this message would land on this Sunday after this week. And, and because of that, be, I, I was tempted to just scrap it a couple days ago and go with something different. Uh, but I feel like this is just how God lined it up. Amen. And so I'm just going to submit it to him. And uh, uh, I, I, would, I would have preached it one way or the other. I think it needs to be today. So would you just stop with me for a minute? I don't usually do this, but I just feel like we should pray before we go on any further, would you just pray with me? Lord, I thank you for your word. Your word is life and health to our bones. Your word is good. Your word is helpful. Your word is, he your word is healing. Your word corrects at times. Your word guides us. And I just pray you'd open up our hearts to you, to your word, to your spirit today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, would you turn to Hebrews 11.23? That's the verse we're at, and I'll, I'll get there in just a moment, but I, I want to give you some context uh, before, before we read it together. But you can still take a sneak peek if you want. So what is the courageous thing to do when you're faced with a life or death decision? What's the courageous thing to do? Last week, we talked about one of the great heroes of the faith, Joseph. In fact, for the past two weeks, we've been talking about Joseph. But we're moving on in the story now, and Joseph's generation has died out. Joseph is, has died, all his brothers have died, and the, um, uh, some decades, some centuries have gone by. And the, the pharaoh who had favored Joseph and had given him the position to oversee the country, that pharaoh was gone. And now there was a new pharaoh, a new king of Egypt. So we have God's people, the Hebrews, the Israelis, living sort of like a country within a country, a nation within a nation. And God's people began to multiply and began to grow more and more powerful because God was blessing them. They had many kids. Their flocks increased. They were becoming more and more influential and, and, and bigger to the point that the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, was alarmed. And in his words, he says, they now outnumber us. So I, I don't know if they did a census or if he's feeling outnumbered or overwhelmed. I don't know. But he, he's alarmed. Like, hey, we can't let this be. This is our country. They, they are our guests in our country, and we cannot let this be. And so he began to take control. And the first thing that they did is they enslaved the Hebrews. So God's people, they took God's people that had been, they had been invited there back when Joseph was alive. So uh, about, about three or 400 years earlier. And now they were, they were enslaved. And, and not just like, please come and dust my house kind of slavery. More like make bricks out in the field, make me cities and build up Egypt. They, they were harsh with them. They were severe taskmasters. They were ruthless, unki unkind, merciless, and it was bad. But the Pharaoh still was not satisfied because even in that oppression, God's people thrived. And that's encouraging to me to know that even in oppression, you can thrive if you are in God and God is in you. 
That, that, it, it doesn't matter the circumstances around you. What matters is God in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, hope of glory. So Pharaoh is like, okay, this is not working. I, I was trying to kind of tamp them down by, uh, by enslaving them all. That's not working. They're getting more and more powerful. They're, they're, uh, they're outnumbering us. I'm worried. And so he comes up with another plan, population control. So in that day, they didn't have like walk-in clinics. They didn't have birthing centers. And so they had midwives. So uh, uh, a female that was trained to help another female give birth. And there were two midwives, two Hebrew midwives at the time. And so Pharaoh came to them and said, this is what I'm ordering you to do. If the Hebrews have a boy baby, you make up an excuse, you kill that baby at birth. You say something, there was complications with the delivery or, um, oops, I dropped the baby. I don't know what, but make up something and kill, if it's a boy, kill those boy, boy newborns. And if it's a girl, you can let them live. Well, in Exodus 1.17, it says, But because the midwives feared God, they refused to obey the king's orders. They allowed the boys to live too. So did you hear that? So the king came to these midwives, this little business they had going, and, and ordered them to kill babies, and they, and they refused to do it. And they made some excuses and, the, and Pharaoh bought them for some reason. I don't know. But these midwives showed courageous faith. They disobeyed their king, and they refused to kill any newborn babies. Hallelujah. They, they were doing their part to, to, to stop the slaughter of the innocents. Amen. And I, I, I just want to point out, this is kind of a side note, this is the one situation where it's okay to break the law. As, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we are very law-abiding. Law abiding. But this is the one time when it's okay, it's even right to break the law. And that is when the law is ordering you to sin against your God. Amen. We see it over and over again. Daniel was ordered not to pray. He prayed anyway. I'm not going to stop praying because the government says not to pray. And uh, Peter and James in the New Testament, they said, I, they, they commanded them, you do not preach Jesus anymore. They went out and preached Jesus again. Because that is one time when we disobey. Now, Paul says, we disobey respectfully. We submit to governing authorities. And that has to do with your attitude. So your attitude is not like flipping off the, the authority and swearing at them. That's not your attitude. Your attitude is, I, I'm sorry. If there's a choice between obeying you and my God, I will obey my God. And, and I will take the consequences. That's, that's right. Remember, church, we're looking back. And it's easy to applaud for those guys the day could be coming, it's going to be you and me. It, it could be. We, we, don't, we don't know what's right around the corner. Let's us stand up like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and say, we're not bowing to your idol. Amen. Not, not going to do it. Because I will obey God rather than man. If there's a choice, I mean, if, it, if it's a true conflict, uh, we're, we're going to try to obey the law as much as we can, but not if it conflicts with serving our God. The king of kings always takes precedence over your king. King of king takes precedence over your king. Amen. So Pharaoh saw this is not working. The, the babies are all being born. The little boys are not being killed. So in Exodus 122, he said he came up with a new plan. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. So he made a national uh, executive order. And he said, throw every newborn Hebrew boy into the Nile River. But you may let the girls live. Can you imagine the trauma, the weeping, the crying in the land as people were snatching newborn baby boys from the Hebrews, from the slaves, and throwing them into the Nile River? This is terrible. Well, about this time, a Hebrew couple got married and had a baby son. And that's where Hebrews 11.23 comes in. It was by faith 
that Moses' parents hid him for three months when he was born. They saw that God had given them an unusual child, and they were not afraid to disobey the king's command. There it is again. When the king says, kill your babies, we say no. No. And that's, that's what they did. They had courageous faith, Moses' parents. They disobeyed the king, and they refused to let their newborn baby boy die. Can you imagine keeping a newborn quiet for three months? Like, that's all they do is cry. I mean, that, they just scream. That's like, that's their main gift in life. Uh, and it, it kind of reminds me of the movie A Quiet Place. Uh, the, the, they, the couple, the, the, like the lead couple in a, in a quiet place, um, uh, lost my train of thought there for a second. It's coming back. Um, they brought a baby into a world where aliens were ta- attacking anytime they heard a sound. Can you imagine bringing a baby into that? Why would they do that? Well, this couple believed that, uh, that life is worth protecting. Amen. And so they, they did whatever they had to do to protect it. They, in fact, in the movie, they were willing to give up their own lives to save their kids. They believed also that life is worth the sacrifice. So they, they put together a padded box to, that would be soundproof to hide the baby, the newborn baby, and they put a little oxygen mask on it, uh, on it um, so it could breathe and stay alive. Of course, they're taking care of their baby, but it, they felt like life is worth the sacrifice. And that reminds me so much of Moses' parents. So they knew that, that disobeying the king, if they got caught, then it could be their life, it could be their heads on the chop, chopping block. So Moses' parents, they felt like, okay, It's three months, this baby's three months old. We cannot keep this quiet anymore. So they came up with another plan. They put the baby in a waterproof basket and they brought it down to the Nile River where the baby boys were supposed to be thrown and they covered covered him up. The basket had a lid. They, They put it in the reeds along the bank of the Nile River. So it was in the, it was floating in the river, but it wasn't going anywhere because it's sort of caught in the reeds. Uh, sort of like we have cattails here today, maybe something like that uh, along the river bank. Well, uh, it, it's interesting uh, to see that God led them this whole way. So they, they took this baby and put it in the basket, and they, they sent Moses' older sister Miriam to go watch and just see what, what happens to the basket. That was right at the place and right at the time when the princess, Pharaoh's daughter, came down to bathe, uh, probably wash her feet and wash her arms and all that kind of stuff, in the Nile River. She looks over, she sees this basket floating there, has her maid, go get it, bring me the basket. Inside, there's a crying baby boy. The princess is no dummy. She recognizes that's one of the Hebrew slave babies that was supposed to be thrown in the Nile. But they put it in a basket in the Nile. She decided... I want, I want that baby. I'm going to adopt that baby. This is crazy. Like, who could even imagine that the princess would adopt a Hebrew slave baby? And I, I don't know what her situation was. The Bible doesn't tell us. Maybe she was barren. And so she just saw this as an opportunity. She's in royalty. I'm taking that. Maybe, maybe it was that kind of a situation. Uh, but we, we don't know. So Miriam, the older sister, was watching all this. So she goes up to the princess, hey, princess, would you like me to go get someone from the, among the slaves to nurse the baby for you? The, the princess said, absolutely, I will even pay her. Princess is no dummy. I'm sure she knows it's the baby's mother. And that's what she does. Miriam goes and gets her mom, who has already been nursing the baby, and she gets to continue to nurse her baby. And she gets paid for it. I was talking to somebody at Kids Day. <laughs> One of our moms, I won't name her, she is here, and she said, that would be awesome to get paid to take care of my kids. In fact, she, she did figure out a way to do it, so she is also, also pretty smart. <laughs> I love that. That is awesome. 
Well, uh, so the, the baby, uh, the, Moses' mother nursed him, raised him, uh, you know, got him to the point where he was weaned. And she took that baby back. She kept, she kept her, her word. as She brought Moses back to the princess and, and said that we had an agreement that you're adopting this baby. And so I brought this baby back to you. The, the princess takes Moses into her palace and begins to raise the slave as a prince. Pretty amazing story. And I, I just love how the, the, uh, the parents, Moses' parents, said it's worth the sacrifice to give him up for adoption to preserve his life. Amen. And it was at that point where I realized, oh, that's where this message was going. Because even when I planned this character, this group on this day, I had written, I don't know if you remember, I had written in the preaching calendar a different topic. And I realized, oh, no. I see what this is about now. <laughs> Two days ago, the Supreme Court of the United States overturned Roe versus Wade. And so abortion is no longer considered a woman's constitutional right in the United States. And now the authority to regulate or ban or, 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 or yeah, regulate abortion goes to each state. As followers of Jesus Christ... We do not look for wisdom in any political party, in any person, or any political agenda when it comes to morality. We look to God's word and the spirit of God when it comes to morality. So today, I'm not going to talk to you about abortion. I'm going to talk to you about life. I'm not going to, we're really not a political church, so I'm not going to talk to you about right versus left or this agenda versus that agenda. I'm going to talk to you about God's agenda. And really, we can't go wrong there. Other agendas change. I remember uh, when the Defense of, of Marriage Act was signed by a lot of prominent Democrats. And what was it, like eight years later? They said, oh no, just kidding. They changed their morality. So, we're going to base our morality on the unchanging word of God. Amen. And that is a secure and safe place to be. <laughs> yeah. So what does God's word say about life? That's what I'm going to talk about, about life. Well, first of all, God creates every human being and he breathes his life into them. Every human being is created by God. So there are no mistakes. Every human being is created by God. It's just a couple of the verses that come to mind. Genesis 127, in the first book of the Bible, it says this. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God creates life. L human life comes from God. Amen. In Psalm 139, very famous passage, verses 13 and 14, uh, the psalm writer is, is praising God, and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he writes, You made all the delicate inner parts of my body, and you knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship, Lord, is marvelous. How well I know it. God is the creator of life, Amen. of human life. Here's a second thing I see in God's word. Life begins at conception. Life begins at at conception. I read so much this week, and I could bring you doctors' uh, reports. I, I could bring you all kinds of stuff of you know, heartbeat at this week and brain waves at this week, and how almost 90 uh, or um, over 90% of abortions happen after those things, which are scientifically what we say is life. Life begins at conception. I go back to the Word of God. Psalm 139, 15 to 16 says, You watched me, Lord as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. God was there. 
You saw me before I was born, and every day of my life was recorded in your book. It's not like a blob until nine months, and then God suddenly has a plan for them. God creates life and puts, he says, I know your name. This is what your name is. This is what the, the, your, your skills are going to be, your gifts are. God has a plan for your life. This, I know how long your life is going to last. God is the creator, and life begins at conception. In Jeremiah, there's a couple of uh, just kind of cool um, uh, examples where God spoke this to a person. Jeremiah 1.5, God spoke to Jeremiah and said, I knew you. Before I formed you in your mother's womb, before you were born, I set you apart. He was already living. He already had a plan for Jeremiah before he ever came out of the womb. Here's another really fun one in Luke chapter 1, verses 44 to 40, uh, 4, 41 to 44. is the story of when Mary, the mother of Jesus, was pregnant. She went to visit her elderly cousin Elizabeth who was way past the childbearing age, but God gave her a miraculous child. She also was pregnant. And uh, it says, at the sound of Mary's greeting, so Mary goes to visit Elizabeth. Hi, hi, cousin Elizabeth. Elizabeth's child leaped within her. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women and your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? When I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. There's already some communication going on. Cousin to cousin in there. Jesus and John the Baptist. Elizabeth's child was John the Baptist. Pretty amazing stuff. Life begins at conception. That is what we believe based on God's word. And then a third, a third um, a concept I see in, about life in the Bible. God values human life at every stage. God values human life at every stage. Amen. In the womb, as a newborn baby, as a teenager, as a young adult, as an elderly person, God values human life at every stage. And you see it in the Big Ten. You know the Big Ten? The Ten Commandments? There's a very simple, very straightforward in there. Uh, Exodus 20, 13. You must not murder. You must not murder because God values life. And if you're going to snuff out someone's life, there's going to be the most intense consequences. Because God values human life at every stage. That's why Jesus said the top two commandments are love God and love people. Love your neighbor as yourself. So we don't even take our own life. Because, why? Because God values life. Not because we necessarily do, but because we come God's way. God said he values life, so therefore we value life as followers of God, as followers of Jesus Christ. So what are you supposed to do in response to God's word. I have, I have two main responses, a couple of details under each one, but I got two, two main responses to God's word today about life. Here's the first one. Press in to God's grace for you. Press in to God's grace for you. Maybe you found yourself in a situation where you or your partner had an unwanted or unplanned pregnancy. Maybe you were pressured to have an abortion. A friend of ours wrote on, on Facebook uh, this, this weekend about how she was pressured. She didn't do it, but she was intensely pressured as an 18-year-old uh, when she was pregnant. Or maybe you did the pressuring that someone else would have an abortion. Or maybe you assisted in an abortion. All this talk about abortion over these past several weeks as we're waiting for the decision and now the decision's been made by the Supreme Court, all this talk about uh, abortion, I'm sure it stirs up memories and emotions in you. Maybe it even stirs up some guilt or feelings of shame. But today, we're focusing on life. We're focusing on life, and there is life for you 
in Jesus Christ. There is grace for you in Jesus Christ. No matter what you've done in the past, I'm just going to run through some scriptures really quick. Romans 3.23 says, Everyone has sinned. I have sinned. Look around you. Everyone here has sinned. Everyone has sinned. That is Bible. Romans 6.23 tells us that God's penalty for sin is death. So sin brings death upon us. Sin is paid for with death. The one who sins shall die. But Jesus paid the penalty for our sin when he laid down his life on the cross. So Jesus said, I know the penalty for sin, God's penalty for sin is death. I will die. So no one else has to if they put their faith in my sacrifice. Romans 8, verse 1, and I, I should mention just before, before I go on there, there, that God's gift to you is eternal life. If you put your faith in Jesus, God's gift to you is eternal life. Romans 8, 1 says, So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Okay, so here is Bible. If you have put your faith in Jesus, or if you're about to do it today, God does not condemn you. If you had an abortion, if you pressured someone to have an abortion, or if you assisted an abortion, God does not condemn you. I don't condemn you. The church does not condemn you. We love you. God loves you. You know what they say. Hate the sin. Wait. Love the sinner. Forgive the sin. That's how it goes. <laughs> Love the sinner. Forgive the sin. That's what God does with sin when we bring our sins to him. Psalm 103 verses 12 to 14 says, He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. In other words, infinitely far from us. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. For he knows how weak we are, praise God, and he remembers we are only dust. So God is not waiting to punish you. God is waiting to forgive you. God is waiting to give you life, eternal life. And won't it be amazing when we meet 60 million babies in heaven that we were not able to meet on earth and they are there enjoying the presence of Jesus right now waiting for you to get there and when you get there they're going to throw open their arms wide and say welcome home mom welcome home dad Welcome home. We finally get to meet each other. That's what's waiting for you. If you're online, listen to this. Don't take one sound bite. Listen to the whole message. God loves you. He forgives you. He's got a good plan for you. He offers you eternal life. There is therefore now no condemnation. That's the church's stance. God's limitless grace is yours in Christ Jesus. Second response. Maybe that one didn't apply to you necessarily, so this one will. So first response, press into God's grace for you. Second response, present God's grace to others. Wouldn't it be amazing if right now, when everyone, it seems like, is threatening violence for everything, <laughs> and especially this, this latest decision, wouldn't it be awesome if all of us in this room, all of us who hear this message, all of us who are part of Hope and Life, decide we're just going to be grace distributors? It's not multi-level marketing, but it's much better. We're going to just, everywhere we go, we're going to look for someone to give God's grace to. 
wouldn't that be awesome if that's what we're known for? If we actually are out spreading hope and life? You and I have experienced God's grace, right? We're sinners. We're forgiven. If you ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins, we're forgiven. So we got God's grace to give by the boatload, by the heartload. Let's go give God's grace. So how can you find ways to show God's love to others who are hurting or who are angry? And there's a lot of people angry right now. Let's go give them grace. Let's go give them. Let's not fight them. Let's not take them on on social media. What good does that do? Let's go show God's grace to them. Let's figure out ways. Let's say, Holy Spirit, show me how. Give me the most creative ways to show grace that have ever been shown on the, on, on the planet. How can you be a light in a dark situation? You got the light in you. Go share it. You go share it. Bring some light. Change the atmosphere. 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 Change the atmosphhere. Change the atmosphhere. Change the atmosphhere. Change the atmosphhere. Change the atmosphhhere. Change the atmosphhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhh
Go offer support to that worker, coworker, or classmate. What has Jesus resourced you to do? What is he calling you to do? I don't know. No guilt from me. I'm, I'm just, as your pastor, saying, go pray. Go ask God. God, what are you calling me to do? And then do whatever he says. Just do that. Just do that. Well, baby Moses eventually grew up. He wasn't supposed to. The king said, throw him in the Nile. He was not supposed to grow up. He just happens to be the one God chose to deliver Israel out of slavery. And he had some of the most amazing encounter, encounters with God. And we'll, we'll talk about that uh, in future Sundays. But one of the things that Moses said right at the end of his life, just before God's people were ready to go into the promised land, it's written down in Deuteronomy 30, 19 to 20. This is what the Holy Spirit spoke through Moses. Today, I have given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. Oh, that you would choose life. You can make this choice by loving the Lord your God, by obeying him, and by committing yourself firmly to him. This is the key to your life. How do you choose life? Commit to the Lord. <laughs> and not only commit to him, but commit to obey him, to follow him, to commit to love him. That's how you choose life. When you choose the Lord, you're choosing life because he is life. Would you stand to your feet? We're going to make this place a place of prayer. If you're online, don't, don't go away. Stick with us. Let's pray together. And I want to pray for you. Would you just bow your heads with me? And let's pray. Lord, you have given us this invitation in your word to choose life. Holy Spirit, you spoke through this prophet and you, you, you offered us this invitation. Come and choose life. And so, Lord, today we choose life. We choose you, Lord. We want you. We want your ways, Lord God. We want you. Lord, I pray, Lord God, that there would be life for the unborn in our country today. Lord, I pray that you would use this Supreme Court decision, use it to make people think. Use it to help young people who are feeling pressured. Use it to help them to, to explore. I wonder if there's another option. And Lord, we pray for life. We pray for life because that's what we believe you value and you would want. We pray for life, Lord. With your head still bowed, I want to ask you, no one's looking around, if you need God's grace, would you raise your hand? And then you can just put it back down. If you experienced pain or guilt related to abortion, maybe you had one, maybe you pressured someone, maybe you helped perform one, uh, you can raise your hand or just catch my eye, either way. And I'm just going to look around slowly. And uh, if that's affected you, why don't you look at me? I, I, I see some eyes, yeah? And I, I just want to pray for you. I, 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 I just am, I am so desiring that you would experience God's grace in, in boatloads because God loves you so much. If you are facing an unwanted pregnancy right now, you are pregnant or your partner is pregnant and that was not planned and not wanted, would you raise your hand or catch my eye? And I, will, I would like to just to pray for you. Yeah. All right. Let's pray. Lord, you see every person who just responded with an upraised hand or or eye. Uh, many people online are responding right now, and I could not see them, but I'm so thankful, Jesus, that you can see them. And so you see everyone right now who's praying for your grace. Jesus, I remember the scripture that says, Jesus, full of grace and full of truth. It's not one without the other. And so, Jesus, I pray you come in the fullness of your grace. We've heard the truth today. 
Lord, I pray against any condemnation because I, I can do that confidently because it's not your will. We read it today. You declared, and I just declare over, over each person that we're praying for right now, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, I just bind the enemy's voice that would bring condemnation to anyone hearing this message today. In Jesus' name, we push back condemnation. And in Jesus' name, we lose acceptance, forgiveness, love, the grace of God right now over every life. Uh, Jesus, I, I put myself in with this group uh, just because I am a person who needs your grace. And I'm so thankful, Lord, that you gave me grace. And I'm so thankful that you're giving every person who asks for it today grace. Grace. Grace of God. We receive the grace of God right now. Would you just even say that to the Lord in your own words? I receive your grace. I receive your grace. I'm forgiven. I'm chosen. I'm loved by God. I receive your grace. God's grace is filling my life. God's grace is washing over me right now. I can hold my head high because I'm holding it up in the grace of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, help us press into your grace. With your head still bowed, if you feel a nudge from the Holy Spirit to present God's grace to others, to offer life, to help others choose life in any way, big or small, if you feel a nudge of the Holy Spirit, like, yes, he's calling me to do something, be Jesus with skin on or, or get involved in some way, would you just raise your hand? I want to pray for you. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, several people, several people. God's, God's talking. God's moving right now. That is awesome. Lord, for each of us with a hand raised, Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would not let these moments pass, but you begin to speak to us, Lord, what are you calling us to do? Maybe, Lord, we have not noticed that person who works with us or in our extended family or, or, or a neighbor. Lord, maybe we've not even noticed. Lord, we're asking you right now, open our eyes. Help us to notice. Help us to care. Lord, some of us, you might be calling us to give, to pray, to serve, to volunteer in some organization, Lord. Lord, make it clear. Lord, as we, as we take a step towards you, Lord, take a step towards us and just show us, guide us, Lord God. Show us where we'd be most fruitful. And Lord, I do pray for all of us, Lord God, that you would help us all to present grace in our words in our attitudes, on social media. Lord, I pray that you would help us to keep our mouths closed if we can't speak love and grace. Lord God, help us, Lord. Help us to discipline ourselves so that only what comes out, uh, so that what comes out is only grace. It's only mercy. It's only love. Lord, let us be peacemakers. Blessed are those the peacemakers, Lord God. Let us be blessed like that one last invitation. If, if you have not yet put your faith in Jesus Christ to save you, then I want to invite you to do that. How do you do that? Turn away from your sin, turn your life over to Jesus, and let him lead. That's start there. He'll take you from there. Start there. If you've never put your faith in Jesus, then this is your day. If you've wandered away, if you've been doing your own thing, if you've been making all your own choices, for a while, then perhaps it's your day to come back. So I, I just want to ask you, just like I've been doing, would you raise your hand if today's your day, you want to put your faith in Jesus and become a Christian today? Would you raise your hand in the room and online? God sees you, you know. God sees you. Excellent. Would you repeat a prayer after me? Say this aloud. Jesus, I invite you into my life. I acknowledge I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin and make me new. I choose to follow you in Jesus' name. Amen. And if you prayed that prayer, the answer is yes. It's always yes. You are forgiven. You are cleansed. You are part of God's family. Hallelujah. We welcome you. And I just want to know. So if you made that decision today, would you fill out the Connect card? Uh, online, you're filling out the QR code. In, in person, you're filling out the, the Connect card. Just check one of the boxes at the bottom.
And that lets me know the decision you made today. And we'll be praying for you. God bless you. Amen. Wow. <laughs> Amen. The Lord speaketh. <laughs> well, here's what I took from that message. One, God loves life. And two, God loves you. And there is forgiveness for whatever. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God loves life and God loves you. Amen? Amen. Well, this time the ushers are going to be coming down the aisles. They're going to be collecting those um, connect cards. So if you filled those out, go ahead and put them in there. If you still have a prayer request, now's the time. Write really, really fast. Pop them in that bucket. And then we will see you all next Sunday. God bless you. Oh, one more thing. <laughs> if, you are a, if you are a lady and you are um, signing up for the Bible study, the new ladies' Bible studies, please speak with Pastor Shelley. She has a book for you. God bless. <laughs>